Lee's victory in the Seven Days Campaign, he was very concerned about his strategic position. McClellan's army was still at Harrison's Landing, bloodied but still powerful, a mere day's march from Richmond, and General Burnside had a force of 15,000 troops aboard ships that could strike at any time. Meanwhile, there was a large Union force under Joseph Hook at Fredericksburg. What became most alarming, however, was a force led by Pope, which on July 16th occupied Culpeper. If Pope continued his advance, he would reach Gordonsville and cut Richmond's supplies from the Shenandoah Valley. Lee sent Jackson's division to Gordonsville to head off Pope. Jackson arrived first. After Lee sent him A.P. Hill's division, Jackson was ordered to advance on Pope's forces. Jackson advanced on Pope's forces near Cedar Mountain. The battle initially favored Pope's forces who attacked on Jackson's flank. However, they were repulsed at the last moment, and the Confederates went on the offensive. The battle, which took place on August 9th, ended in a stalemate. The battle was not resumed on the 10th. On the 11th, when Union forces suggested a truce so that the dead and wounded could be tended to, Jackson readily agreed, since by now Pope's forces were being steadily reinforced. Thus, he had decided to withdraw. While Jackson was forced to withdraw after the Battle of Cedar Mountain, he had successfully thwarted Pope's further advances. Now the strategic advantage switched to Lee. General Halleck had become the new commander of all U.S. forces. When McClellan made it clear that he would not engage in any offensive action without substantial reinforcements, Halleck, with Lincoln's concurrence, ordered that he withdraw from the James River. Thus, Lee was free to remove his forces from around Richmond and concentrate them against Pope. He had a short window of opportunity, however, which would be open only while McClellan's army was in transit. Lee's forces joined Jackson opposite Pope. It was Lee's plan to attack Pope while his forces were between the Rapidan and the Rappahannock River. Before he could attack, however, Pope, on August 19th, pulled his forces back behind the Rappahannock. All of Lee's attempts to cross the river were repulsed. His one success was sending the cavalry, commanded by Jeb Stuart, on a raid behind Union lines to Warrenton Junction, where he seized Pope's personal baggage. After Stuart's successful raid, Lee decided to follow it with a much larger attack. On August 25th, he sent Jackson's division on a large flanking movement to the west of Pope and through Thorough Gap Pass. Time was running out, for elements of the Army of the Potomac were arriving every day. On the evening of August 26th, Stonewall Jackson appeared at Pope's rear, striking Pope's supply line on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad at Bristol Station and the massive supply station at Manassas Junction. Jackson, with his 24,000 men, instead of retiring, decided to make a stand near Manassas. He sent his men a few miles away to a ridge overlooking the Warrenton Pike. Pope lost sight of him and first ordered his troops to converge on Manassas and then on Centerville, but Jackson could not be found. Jackson took matters into his own hands and had his troops open fire on a passing Federal division led by General Gibbons. The passing soldiers were surprised but did not panic. Each side stood its ground and fired until it was too dark to see anything to fire at. The short battle that was merely a prelude to tomorrow's battle became known as the Battle of Groveton, and 2,300 men were casualties when it ended. The next day, Pope ordered an attack against Jackson's line. Although Pope had an overwhelming numerical advantage, he was unable to deploy all of his forces against Jackson's forces entrenched in excellent defensive positions. Jackson's forces successfully repelled the various federal assaults. That night, Pope became convinced that Jackson and the Confederates were withdrawing, and thus he ordered a pursuit for the morning. Pope was again mistaken. Not only was Jackson not beaten, he was being reinforced. In the morning, Union troops attacking Jackson were met with withering fire. They almost broke through, however, which forced Jackson to ask for help. Help came in the form of an attack by the soldiers of General Longstreet, who, together with the rest of Lee's army, were now present south of Jackson's position. 
Despite the massive attack, the Union lines did not break, but were slowly driven back. For a short while, Union troops made a stand at the Henry House, site of Jackson's stand in the first battle of Bull Run. Slowly, however, Union forces pulled back, crossing the stone bridge over Bull Run. When the last blue coat crossed, they destroyed the bridge. The Union forces reformed at Centerville. The following day, Jackson's tired troops tried to outflank Pope, but in a brief battle, known as the Battle of Chantilly, a few miles north of Centerville, Jackson was repulsed, but at the cost of the lives of Union General Stevens and Phil Kearney.